Hello everybody, it's white to play in this position. Please decide between e takes d5 and queen takes d5. You have two choices. How should this knight be recaptured? That's the question. Folks, we are talking about trade-offs in chess. Our beautiful game has constant trade-offs between different principles. In such positional moments, oftentimes there are conflicting chess principles that are pulling us to different directions. And how are we supposed to choose between two principles which sometimes contradict each other? That's the topic of today's video. And I will show you some interesting positions that are totally about the square on d5, the outpost square on d5, that will present us with such choices. And in the end, we will learn together and we'll get some good lessons all together, folks. Okay? I posted this position to X or Twitter a month ago, and it was seen so many times. It generated so much discussion, actually, that I had to make a video about this. Even Andras Toth, chess coach Andras, made a video about a similar concept after seeing that puzzle on Twitter. Thank you, Andras, for participating in this discussion. So the question is, folks, here, is it e takes d5 or queen takes d5? Chess principles normally tell us that we should not fill an outpost square with a pawn, right? As you can see, this d5 square is an outpost. So chess principles tell us usually that we should take back with a piece and maintain an outpost on d5, correct? All else being equal, that's a desirable move for white. But now let's discuss the other move, e takes d5. If you consider making the move e takes d5, can you please tell me, folks, what this move does to white's position? Can you see any good sides of this move e takes d5? How do you justify this move? Please explain to me, using your own words and observations, of all the good things about e takes d5. Take your time, please. Folks, to my mind, e takes d5 is a good move because it restricts the black pieces. Can you see it? White is a clear space advantage. And by taking on d5, we are saying, you know what? How are you supposed to develop your pieces? All of the minor pieces are terrible right now. And we are intensifying our space advantage. More, moreover, guys, can you see the beautiful point of this? Black cannot play f5 in this position because the pawn structure is changed. If you go back. After e takes d5, the pawn structure has changed. Black has the king side pawn majority. But it's impossible for black to play f5 in this position and gain central control. Moreover, can you see this e4 square that we have now created for our knight, folks? Yes, knight d2 to e4 is coming soon. And this knight will become a hero on this e4 square. That's a de facto outpost on e4 because no black pawn can chase that knight away with either d5 or f5 in this pawn structure. So again, please, are you following me, folks, here? I'm justifying the move e takes d5 by talking to my pieces. Looking at my own pieces, I see potential improvement. I'm looking at the black pieces, I see cramped and restricted position. That justifies. That's why in this position, e takes d5 is a much stronger move then let's say the principled queen takes d5. Because queen takes d5, black can do this, right? Black can get the bishop to a very nice spot with tempo. And after, let's say, queen d3, they now have this beautiful square for their knight. And black is solving their developmental problems. Black is placing their pieces to good squares. And this knight can later jump to f6 to put pressure on e4. And maybe black can even go for the d5 break, right? So in this case, also look at this knight. The knight doesn't do much on, on b3. There is no improvement potential. Yes, you kept the d5 outpost, but how can you exploit that, right? This knight is miles away from reaching the ideal destination d5 in this very moment. So what did we learn? What is the lesson here, folks? Can you please verbalize to me the, the main lesson? The main lesson to my mind is this. We should never automatically make moves in chess. We should always look at those trade-offs, right? When we have choices like that, that's a very critical moment. White can transform the pawn structure or white can get a piece on d5. And in those moments, the main guidance, you see, are the pieces for both sides. Because pawn play always connects to piece activity and restriction in chess. I made two chessable courses about this concept, right? So please bear with me. And please try to understand, because I've seen many players 
who automatically say, yeah, in those Sicilian structures, just take on d5 with the pawn. That's almost always good. But why? You know, why? Oftentimes, that should not be a good move. Imagine that the pawn was still on f2, for example. Black would play f5 and thank you for giving them this option of uh, a 5 push. They're pushing their majority and they're controlling the center, right? But here, in this particular position, that's a great option for white. Knight e4 and white will be crushing this middle game position with great pieces versus black's terrible pieces overall. Now I will show you a very similar position that happened in Fisher game. Knight takes d4. Should black take with the pawn or with the knight on d4? Can you please go through those principles as we discussed today and make the right choice for black? What is the right recapture for black in this position? Please stop the video and think for yourself first. Folks, in this very position, taking back with the pawn again is the right choice and i want you to tell me what i want you to tell me why why do you think in this particular position e takes d4 which is filling the outpost on d4 with a pawn which is just goes against the chess principles why is this move a good choice for black there's a very clear answer folks and congratulations if you saw the knight on a4 and now the knight has become a buried piece right by taking back with the pawn you're limiting and shutting down that knight on the rim this knight is crying right now, and that gives black great compensation for the pawn. White had an extra pawn in this position, but now because of the knight's problem on e4, black has compensation in this position. Fisher, in fact, took back with the pawn. If you take back with the knight, yes, your knight is maintaining this d4 outpost, but this knight is alive. They will come back to the game with knight c3. They will later challenge your knight with bishop e3, maybe knight e2, right? And white's extra pawn might tell in the long run in this position. So again, in all these junctions, we have to be very careful. This example also teaches us it's all about peace activity and restriction in this case, right? Black is betting that this pawn is limiting that knight so much that he's willing, voluntarily filling an outpost square with a pawn. Yes, that was an outpost for black. That's a key square on the board. But now black is filling it with a with pawn and justifying this move with peace activity. Another position, MVL versus Magnus Carlsen. MVL goes knight d5 and Magnus take on d5. White has three choices, folks. What is the correct recapture? Please stop the video and think for yourself first. And again, justify your move in terms of peace activity. You're a great player, folks. If you found MVL's move, rook takes d5, of course. By taking back with the rook, we are maintaining the d-file pressure. We are pressing on the backward pawn on d6. We are keeping our rooks very active. And this way, right, we are paralyzing the black pieces. That's the main function of attacking a weakness in chess. That d6 pawn is a target. White puts pressure. And this way, black's pieces are paralyzed and they are tied down in guarding that pawn. White later on won this beautiful game. That was a very long game, but it was only one-sided event. White was pressing all the time. Later on, he pushed a4, a5, b4, opened up the second front on the queen side, later shift their rooks to a6, and then put pressure, create the second front later with f4 and so on, and White won the game. This way, White keeps the advantage by purely by peace activity, right? If you go back and take back with the pawn, that will be a very, very bad move. Yes, White improved their pawn structure and chess principles tell us, hey, you have double pawns. So in the earliest opportunity, you should undouble your pawns. You see how principles are clashing in this case? But this would also make your rooks crying in this position. Your rooks are just pointing towards your own pawn on d5. Right now, this d6 pawn is no longer a weakness because a weakness is only a weakness in chess if it can be exploited, right? And Magnus would probably play rook f8 and then dream of this f5 pawn break to activate his pieces on the f file. And now suddenly it's black who is maintaining the advantage and pressure and pull in his position. You see, it was not worth it. White should not undouble double their pawns, but keep the pawns doubled like that, but go for peace activity in his position. E takes d5 is even worse because you still have the double pawns and now you gave black, right? This option of f5 and black keeps rolling their king side pawn majority and your rooks and heavy pieces 
are just crying and those rooks have loved seeing e takes d5 because now they don't need to babysit the pawn on d6 folks Smyslov game with white pieces you have two choices again we are talking about this d5 outpost that's why i structured this video folks we will keep talking about this outpost on d5 and make the right decision by asking ourselves the right questions should white capture with the bishop and thus maintain the outpost for the piece or should white take back with e pawn and create a connected past pawn on c6 it's your turn folks you have two choices please stop the video right now and think for yourself first folks you're a great player if you found Svislov's move bishop takes d5 the bishop is alive white is keeping the bishop alive in this position and play the position as such if you take back with the e pawn this looks beautiful at first sight right hey look at me i am creating a connected past pawn on c6 that looks like an amazing pawn but after knight c7 black simply blockades your pawn and this bishop is crying look at this bishop this bishop is in great misery because you re recaptured with the pawn on d5 the bishop is dead this bishop is not doing much the rooks are just pointing towards their pawn on c6 but a single knight is blockading that pawn thus shutting down those pieces plus you gave the king side pawn majority to black by recapturing with the e pawn now black can also dream of playing f5 and create play on the king side in this position this would not be great at all for white to recapture with the pawn right again we see how chess principles clash basically hey should i create a protected passer or should i keep my pieces active again we see that piece activity is trumping over structural considerations Smyslov took back with the bishop guys and after knight c7 well the game went like this bishop a2 and white simply keeps a clear edge by maintaining their piece activity and this defile pressure will be relevant at some point right that's also the final advantage of taking back with the bishop because this pawn is still weak on a semi-open file so white can later on dream of putting pressure on the pawn later Smyslov improved their bishop like this and play the game on both sides while keeping the bishop pair keeping the good pieces and black really if you pay close attention black really has no clear counterplay in this particular position and this pawn was still a big strength for white it was tying down the black pieces but you did not need to shut down your bishop by recapturing with the pawn in this case folks connecting to this team that's a student game d5 and e takes d5 is on the board now i will give you two choices do you take back with the c pawn or with the bishop i also posted this position to x or twitter and that also led to great discussions i very much love this moment as well please give yourself more time in this case stop the video go deeper white has an extra pawn in its position okay i mean after you recapture the pawn you will have an extra pawn in the structure but still you have to be careful in converting your advantage in this case what is the right recapture and more importantly why is that the case can you justify the correct move to me folks by using some nice principles take your time folks you're a great player if you came up with the move c takes d5 this looks so ugly oh my god it hurts my eye even to see this move white voluntarily goes for double pawns white seems to be shutting down their bishop what is white doing in this case it looks like a chess crime at first sight to recapture with the pawn now i will tell you all the good things about this move and maybe you will start believing me okay look at the first thing by recapturing with the pawn i open the c file now my rooks know what to do i created a backward pawn on c7 my plan is very simple just rook c1 and double up on the c file and put pressure my rooks got much more active and i created a weakness on c7 that's usually a great sign when you both activate your pieces and at the same time you create a clear target that will tie down the black pieces notice that it's very difficult for black to attack the pawn on d5 yes that's a weak pawn but how can you attack that pawn the bishop cannot go to e6 and this plan also has drawbacks right because now you're giving me a chance to play d6 and hit your rook and so on it's very very difficult for black to even healthily 
take back the pawn on d5 in this position. And my counterattack is coming very, very soon anyways. Right? So these are the very typical and nice observations for you to see. By taking back with the pawn as well, you're shutting down the black piece activity. The rook is now passive. The bishop cannot reach e6 and so on. Right? So these are all the good points behind c takes d5 in its position. For example, bishop f5, rook c1, rook d7, and I will easily, easily play. Maybe rook c4 followed by rook c1, and you know exactly what's coming on this c7 pawn. Now, let's look at the principled move bishop takes d5. This keeps the pawn structure intact and activates your bishop. So what can be wrong with this move? I'm sure many players would take back with the bishop without even thinking in this position. What's the problem? The problem is this. After c6, let's say bishop g2, black will play rook d4 and they will keep a bind on the d file. They will go bishop f5 or bishop e6, rook d8, and they will put enormous pressure on your pawn on d2. That pawn will be impossible to roll and that's your extra pawn in this position. So you have to make use of this pawn and it will be impossible. So that's a clearly very, very close to equal position for black. Black has great saving chances in this very position folks okay so you can also start with bishop f5 of course it's more or less the same right let's say this rook c1 and they will do this rook d4 and rook d8 and black will put enormous pressure on your pawn on d2 in this position if you pay close attention here you understand it's almost impossible for white to make a clear progress from this position can you see it folks so this had to be seen from this very position that white by recapturing with the bishop is giving this option to black. Black pieces get more active, right? Their rook gets more active, their bishop gets more active, and you have no clear target for your rooks. Finally, yeah, the final point. These rooks are basically functionless. You have to defend your d2 pawn probably with your rooks at some point, and you're tying down your pieces in this case. Again, we see once again, right, guys, that the decision maker, the deal breaker, so to speak, is the piece activity. I want to give my rooks a clear target. I want to activate my pieces. And I'm, and I'm believing that this pawn cannot be easily recaptured by your pieces. Thus, your pieces has to tie down in defending backward pawns like that. And this is a much better option for white. And again, if you ask the engine, engine will tell you that c takes d5, although paradoxical looking, is a much better option than bishop takes d5. I am proud of myself. That was a student game. And I was looking at this position, guys. I will be a little bit cocky with you. C takes D5 was my initial hunch. And I was correct, right? My intuition told me that CD must be a good move because I've seen similar patterns before in English opening, right? So again, pattern recognition kicked in here. I saw similar notice before. And this, this bishop is restricting move like C6 as well, right? This pawn is not be easily attacked. And rook C1, rook C7, an easy, easy play for white in this position. Let's finish with the homework position, folks. The question is, should black take on d5 or should black play knight c6 in this case? Try to implement the lesson you learned today and please choose between two options. Should we give white a double pawns by capturing on d5 or should we play, let's say, knight c6 in this position, okay? Please go through it yourself. Try to understand the situation. Ask yourself those basic questions. And please write to me on YouTube with your explanations of why that move should be correct. What did we learn in this lesson, folks? We always finish with some nice takeaway messages, right? Chess is a difficult game. That's the first lesson, right? We should never make an automatic move. There are usually conflicting principles that are clashing with each other. And of course, as a beginner, as a club player, I'm sure you know many, many, many chess principles. You heard somewhere, you read some books, right? All these rules of thumb, so to speak, is stored in your long-term memory. But the problem is this, right? How do you apply? How do you compare? How do you choose when different chess principles are conflicting with each other? That's what makes chess a difficult game because there's not a single algorithm that you can always apply in any given position, right? So this takes a skill. It's also based on experience, of course, right? As you play more games, as you analyze more games, your intuition will grow. Just as my hunch with that C takes D5 moment, right? It's based on years of experience of play and coaching, obviously, right? But if you're on your own, the usual deal breaker, as we saw in today's episode, folks, is the piece activity. You have to ask yourself, 
which piece of mine are getting happy as a result, or am I restricting the enemy pieces by doing this move, right? That's usually, for example, piece activity in chess is more important than structure. And even material in that case, right? If you look at Alpha Zero games, piece activity and restriction comes first. Alpha Zero gives up pawns, doesn't care about the structure for piece activity improvement, right? So we keep saying that, but how do we apply that, right? So by looking at these examples, we also build our intuition, maybe to prioritize piece activity and restriction over such structural concerns like double pawns, weak pawns, and outposts, and so on, right? So again, it's always a trade-off in chess. And by looking at the right examples, instructive positions, which I'm hopefully giving you in this channel, you can improve the skill, right? By nice explanations. And I want you to think for yourself, actively engage with the material. Try to explain it to yourself or to your friend, those positions. This will also consolidate the lessons you learned today, folks. I hope you liked it. If you liked it, please give me a like and subscribe. And I will be following you with similar content. I'm here to help you improve your game and to drill and learn these examples even more. You have to check my courses, The Art of Awakening Pieces and The Art of Burying Pieces. In those two courses, I will be giving you such trade-offs, such interesting positions that you need to decide by prioritizing peace activity. Thank you so much.